Welcome to Writers Read. We have another chance this evening to hear some writers read their own words in their own voice. But before we do that, we start with Paul's poem, and here we go. I say a line, and you say a line. Write, write, write. Write, write, write. Until you get it right. Until you get it right. Then read aloud. Then read aloud. You'll draw a crowd. You'll draw a crowd. And bring us great delight. And bring us great delight. And we are delighted today to have Erwin Saracen and Barbara Ray read for us today. And thank you to all the writers who have read for us in this session. And we have a few more sessions, I think. So look forward to another Friday, another Monday night session on Channel 370 at 7 o'clock. And as you know, this, I send an email to Erwin and Barbara the week before they read, and I suggest that we talk about their writing process from time to time, and what they might do to share with us how they write, how often they write. So Erwin, you said you were ready <laughs> with some kind of writing tip. <laughs> what do you have to tell us? Well, what I've been working on is something that is different from anything that I've ever tried to do before, so I didn't really have any guidelines, but I developed them. And what this is, is an, what I'll read, is a, an excerpt from a memoir that I've been working on. And the reason I did it was recollections that I have about my, my parents. That it wasn't until after both of them were gone that I began raising questions about how did they do this and why did they do that and what were they thinking about. And I realized how ignorant I was and how kind of dumb I was not to have asked about these things, but it didn't occur to me to ask about them. For example, my father liked to take walks, and it wasn't until 10 years after he died that I began wondering, what did he think about when he was on his walks? He worked as a cutter of infants wear for 50 years. What did he think about while he was doing that? And I came away with the feeling that, you know, I just wish I knew these people better than I do. And so I decided that I don't know whether anybody in my family is going to be interested in knowing about, you know, what I thought about or what I did, but that if at any time they did think about that, I'd like them to have something that might give them an idea of who this person was. So that's what my goal was. And the method that I came up with, and this might not be a good one, is to convey examples of specific things that I and my family did, what my life was like, what I was thinking about, and, and I wanted to include incidents. And so that's been the focus of everything that I've written in this memoir. And what I'd like to read now is something that comes from kind of the middle of what I've been working on. So I'm not going to tell you anything about my childhood, but I just happened to pick a period that might have some resonance with, with some of you because it has to do with when I first came to Seattle and not, not even having much of an idea of why I was coming to Seattle. So this is just a little excerpt from a portion of my life and it's, and, and it's stuffed 
full of incident based on the theory that I have that that's what will make a person come alive if anybody ever reads what that person has written. <clears throat> Family and work were the two main areas of my life after the beginning. What I meant by the beginning was everything that happened beforehand, which fortunately you're not going to have to listen to. Um, looking back at the period during which our children were born and growing up, and I was a junior faculty member, there wasn't much time for reflection and thoughtful consideration of decisions and alternative courses of action. Of course, Barbara, my wife, and I were making all kinds of decisions, but I don't remember pondering them for very long. One issue that we did discuss at some length was whether or not Barbara should work while our children were growing up. Basically, we agreed that it would be best if she stayed home and spent a lot of time with the kids, at least for several years. When Sue, our oldest child, was born, I was somewhat overwhelmed by the fact of her arrival. I had had no prior experience with babies, so Sue was a totally new phase in my life. When she was born, I called our families with good news and even bought a box of cigars for distribution, <laughs> mainly to psychology department members. While I wonder if anybody nowadays hands out cigars, it seemed the appropriate thing to do at the time. Chuck Strother, who was essentially the person who hired me, liked a cigar once in a while. But what did the other people who, like me, didn't care about cigars do with the little gifts that I presented? During the early years in Seattle, I was a pipe smoker with all of the paraphernalia and rituals that went with it. I had a collection of pipes, including corn cobs, oom poles, and one meerschaum pipe. The oom poles I got through the mail from the Wally Frank Company that published a catalog of pipes at discount prices. The oom poles were huge and posed logistical problems because you almost needed two hands just to hold it and fill it and tamp it down and fuss with it. Every catalog of Wally Frank included unfinished pipes that were not only unpolished, but often had disfiguring gouges in the wood. I had pipe cleaners, wooden matches, and a metal lid to cover a pipe in a strong wind. Among the tobaccos I smoked were Walnut, Revelation, Edgeworth, and Prince Albert. An occasional extravagance was Balkan Sobrani. I suspect that one might motivation behind the pipe preoccupation was the desire to seem older and more, and more mature than I was. I was 26 at this time and, felt, and, I, and was much the youngest person in the department and I was younger than many of the students also and I think I was sensitive about that. Fortunately, after a few years, pipes faded out of my life and were replaced by classical music records and later CDs. The, Amer the American Record Guide became the successor to the Wally Frank catalog. <laughs> Sue, Jane, and Don came on the scene within a five-year period after our arrival in Seattle. And this led to a number of changes in how we lived. Shortly after Sue was born, our studio apartment was replaced with a two-bedroom apartment at the Northgate Apartments, and after Jane's birth, by a house. Buying a house with a mortgage was a source of some anxiety for me, but I realized that it was probably the reasonable thing to do. Since we didn't have much money, we decided that for the time being, we would forego a nice view 
and simply get as big a house as we could afford. How that realistic plan led to the house we bought is an intriguing question. Our purchase was a poorly designed, not very spacious house with a beautiful view of Lake Washington. Among the limitations of 13028 42nd Avenue Northeast was that the front door was in the backyard, the garage was tiny, and there was a huge lawn that required mowing. It also had a septic tank that occasionally overflowed in the backyard, and I remember trying to do something about a septic tank problem on one Thanksgiving day. Buying the house was a learning experience for me. After we had told the co-op realty agent that we would buy the house, it dawned on me that you don't buy a house without some sort of negotiations. And counter offers are almost regarded as necessary. At least I thought that was the standard operating procedure. When we got back to the apartment, I called the agent and told him that $18,500 was too much for our budget. And we probably couldn't pay that much. He asked me what we could pay, and pulling a number out of a hat, I said that we could probably handle 17500 He replied, could you handle 17800 I said, yes, and the deal was done. Later, I wondered what would have happened had I said that all we could pay was 16500 <laughs> Still, at that time, I felt I had done some shrewd bargaining. You have to put something in a house besides people. Barbara met this challenge economically and aesthetically. She made visits and purchases to St. Vincent de Paul, built a desk out of a door panel, and painted several rooms. I helped a little bit with the painting. Barbara made curtains, as well as all the children's clothes. She also made bookcase bookcases of the sturdiest crates that she could find. There were a few splurges, the biggest one being a beautiful Scandinavian ducks chair. Another splurge, a year after moving into the house, was a painting Barbara bought at a University of Washington art school auction. The painting was acquired when, as the auctioneer was about to pronounce sold, Barbara shouted, 19, and it entered our collection. She had $19. Since the cost of fixing our Dodge Wayfarer car had been mounting, we had traded it in for a Volkswagen Bug. Taking the huge painting home could be accomplished only by fitting it into the back seat of the Bug so that it leaned quite a bit into the front seat and this complication required that Barbara scrunch forward while holding the door open, and I drove at about 10 miles an hour. The following year, we bought for $20 a much smaller painting at the auction. Our most ambitious art purchase grew out of a visit to the Bellevue Shopping Center Outdoor Art Show. I later found out that this was the second year of the existence of the Bellevue Art Show. The art show now is a very complex affair, but at that time, artists simply sat at card tables around the inside periphery of the Bellevue Shopping Center. Pushing two strollers, we browsed the artwork on display. We were always on the lookout for places to go with the children. The work of one artist Bill Cumming stood out for us. This is the same Bill Cumming, uh, one of whose paintings is in the hall that leads down here. He displayed an art, an oil painting of three jazz musician, musicians and had a large pile of sketches on a card table. We were so taken with the painting that I asked Cummings how much he was asking for it. When he said $200, we realized that that was too much for us. 
Remembering my success with Co-op Realty, I told him that we could pay $125, although we knew his asking price was fair. I suggested that they call us if he couldn't sell the painting for the asking price. The next day I called and we bought it for $125. Several of Cummings' works from the 1930s had been bought by the Seattle Art Museum. Later, he became a communist and developed tuberculosis that resulted in his disappearance from the art scene for close to 20 years. The 1957 painting that we bought was one of his first works after a long period of inactivity. He achieved great success after his return to painting and wrote an autobiography that described the ups and downs of his life. I also bought 10 of his sketches for a dollar apiece. Mm -hmm. Our Bill Cumming collection is percentage-wise probably the best investment I've ever made. And I might mention that about eight or nine years ago, I went to an art gallery that was selling some of his paintings. And oil paintings, not nearly as nice as the one that we had bought, were selling for over $30,000. Mm. People sometimes do things they think they know or they, or they, or know that they shouldn't do, like buying a small house whose front door is in the backyard and buying things at art auctions and at art shows when money is tight. Yet we manage to see ourselves as thrifty, conservative people when it came to money. Dried milk and day-old bread was part of our hybrid lives that included all kinds of economizing and fighting irresistible impulses to make purchases. An example of this hybridized life that we led was purchases at Baker's Bakery in Lake City of trays of delicious day-old pastries which provided great desserts for us. Food was a big deal in our house and there was a long list of Barbara's dishes that resulted in weighty, weighty discussions. Should she make Swedish meatballs, corned beef hash with eggs on top, and Swedish pancakes once a week. I occasionally made a pot of spaghetti made with Campbell's tomato soup, milk, <laughs> sweet cream, and a huge amount of cheese, including Velveeta, Swiss, cheddar, and anything that happened to be available. This dish was prepared and especially served when Barbara was away because she was absolutely amazed at how anybody could even try to eat something as fat as that. And I made this once when Barbara was attending a meeting of the League of Women Voters in New York City. Music for our children played an important role at 13028 42nd Avenue Northeast. One of our favorite children's records was Marcella, the chicken who sang opera. We also listened to folkway records, especially songs sung by Alan Mills, Charity Bailey, Harry Lauder, who was a Scottish music hall entertainer of the early 20th century. His records did not contain songs that were written for children, but nevertheless, we sang them every day with great enjoyment. In addition to Roman and the Gloman, and on the, on the Bonnie Banks of Clyde. We sang all kinds of other songs, and I might mention that I, all, all of these songs are still in my repertory. And so one of them, for example, is a song that kids, little kids, you might not appreciate this, that little kids loved, that began, oh, it's, nice to get up in the morning when the sun begins to shine 
at four or five or six o'clock in the good old summer time. But when the snow is snowing and it's murky overhead, oh, it's nice to get up in the morning, but it's better to stay in bed. And, you know, my kids love that. And then another popular singer in our house was Alan Mills, who was a Canadian folk singer. And he had a song, up in a balloon, boys, up in a balloon, sailing round the little stars and all around the moon. Up in a balloon, boys, up in a balloon, won't we have a jolly time? Up in a balloon. And that song had to be modified as our girls got older and they didn't understand why it was up in a balloon boys. And so it, it changed to the occasionally being up in a balloon girls. In the evening, after the children went to bed, we listened to some classical music. Barbara gave me a record of some of Bux the Hooters music and we listened to it a lot. The records we bought included Schubert's De Schöne Mollerin, sung by the Danish tenor Axel Schertz, Scarlatti's harpsichord music played by Fernando Valenti, and CDs of sonatas for flute and harpsichord by Handel. While it never leads to any awards, I did make, a few so make up a few songs that were appreciated by the children. One began, my name is Sam Slunkalunk, and I pick my nose. They thought that was absolutely <laughs> the funniest song that anybody had ever sung. Another of my songs was, he ate a kippered salad sandwich in the morning. And still another one had to do with the exploits of Ollie Botton Pete. Uh, however, my talents were not limited simply to making up songs. I also made up stories. One dealt with Veronica, a fairy bird who visited Helen and Mary when they faced situations that required a little magic. Helen and Mary stories were told at home and on car trips. When Don came on the scene, Helen and Mary acquired a brother, Jimmy. Although my performances were frequent, Barbara was there all the time. In addition to cooking, baking, and sewing, she introduced the children to the public library, which they visited at least weekly. Barbara was very inventive in involving the kids in most of her activities. She bought a cookbook for children, and its spine gave out after some use. She enrolled the kids in cooperative nursery school and took an active part in the school's activities. She began reading books to the children and made the discovery that you could get books at a very low price from Blackwell's bookstore in Oxford. This is no longer the case. I'm not in Oxford, England. Uh, I read to the children, but not nearly as much as Barbara. She also helped them with science demonstrations, such as making paper from fibers, from fibers like pineapple leaves and arts and crafts projects of various kinds, including things for a Christmas tree. When they were quite a bit older, and I was teaching at the University of Hawaii summer session, after the session, we rented a camper and toured the island, the big island of Hawaii for a week. Each night, before we got into our sleeping bunks, I read aloud a chapter from E.B. White's The Trumpeter's Swan. Barbara was a believer in live entertainment, and we took the kids to puppet shows put on at the university by Professor Aurora Valentinelli. Other favorites or a performance of James Thurber's Many Moons at the university's Penthouse Theater, and one of Benjamin Britten's operas for children, Noah's Flood. The move to 13028 made it possible to reciprocate the hospitality that had been shown 
us by many members of the Department of Psychology. The children were quite interested and attentive when we had pe uh, people over in reciprocation. They commented on all the noise that the visitors made. We noted the movements in the children's bedrooms during these evenings and would occasionally check on what was going on. Usually, we found them standing up, listening intently in their beds and cribs. After a while, we came to accept the fact that some sleep would be lost because of all the noise. We also hoped that there might be some extra sleeping the next day, which never occurred. <laughs> In addition to entertaining people from Seattle, we also had visits from grandparents and siblings. The Rear Homes, Barbara's family, visited a few times, once as part of a train trip with Barbara's sister, Mary Ann, which included several stops in Canada. The children were quite taken with Grandpa Rear Home cigarette smoking, perhaps because it was a change from Daddy's pipe smoking. My mother and Mildred flew to Seattle. My, Mildred was a sister, a first and only for them. While the visit went well, it was pretty clear that they were trying to figure out what reasoning could possibly have rationalized our coming to Seattle. It obviously was too far from Tabachnik's herring store and much too far from Broadway and 42nd Street. The following year, my father flew, again a first for him, to Seattle. He did note some limitations, like the New York Times reaching Seattle three or four days late. But he also was impressed with the natural beauty on display. My mother and Mildred had hardly noticed the view of Lake Washington from our living room, but they did observe that the front door was in the wrong place. We took my father to Mount Rainier, and at the time, it was possible to visit the ice caves near the Paradise Visitor Center. He enjoyed that exploration, as well as the alpine uh, flowers and views of the Cascades. Barbara and the children took him for a boat ride through the government locks, which impressed him and also took him to, se they took him to se several other places. He wasn't overly impressed with Seattle's downtown. Seymour, Esther, and Julie, my brother, sister-in-law, and uh, niece, visited us also. Jane's birthday had occurred, the time, occurred at the time of their visit, and we thought it would be nice to celebrate at Mount Rainier. Barbara baked a cake and prepared a picnic lunch. We found a table with a nice view at about the 5,000 5, foot level. After the lunch, we opened the box that contained the cake and got out the candles. As we were doing this, Esther looked at the other side of the road and pointed to a bear standing there looking at us. We quickly put the cake back in the box, packed up our belongings, and left. The birthday was celebrated when we got home. Other than the bear's intrusion, the visit was a success. The visit the children especially enjoyed was when Mary Ann, Barbara's sister, came to Seattle at Christmas during her stay at the University of Wyoming, where she was working on a master's degree in American studies. The kids were especially intrigued by Mary Ann's use of a hairdryer. At that time, a hairdryer consisted of a large heated bonnet placed over the head that produced a loud, whirring sound. Whenever she used the dryer, the children gathered to gape in amazement at the, at the sight, and they even asked me to take a picture of Mary Ann drying her hair. After the happenings at 13028, there was a progression of cars. The Dodge, Dodge Wayfarer, which we had bought when we lived 
uh, in New Haven, was succeeded by a VW Bug, which was succeeded by a Ford Falcon, called Falcony by the kids. Our fleet expanded to two when we bought a Ford Fairlane. Because of the heat generator in the back seat by Sue, Jane, and Don, the rear window often clouded up. A feature of the Fairlane was a fan that blew air across the rear window and often cleared it of heavy mist. It was very noisy and a far cry from today's window defrosters. And I think that's, I think it's, that probably is it up oh, of reading today's just Maybe at some point in the future you'll hear about the oh, adventures good. of the University of Washington. Thank you so much, Erwin. That was just a rich sharing of your beginning in Seattle. What a good story. And while he's trading places with Barbara Ray, I just want to mention, yes, let's do that. I, I just want to mention there's some new residents in Horizon House who might not know about the collection of books on the windowsill in the back of the library. And that collection has books by us or about us. And I brought two of them today. One of them is Barbara's book called Push the River, don't. or Don't Push the River. She's trying to teach me not to push the river. <laughs> is it working for yeah. her? And then this is Irwin's book that he wrote with his wife, Barbara, Abnormal Psychology. And she mentioned that, he mentioned that he might bring some other books next week and donate them to the library for, to add to this collection. This collection has like 50 books in it. It's an amazing collection in our library. So take a look at that collection on the windowsill. And I have some for sale. Though. And Barbara, yes. hello. Good friend. And you have a little tip, a writing tip about your writing process that might I do. inspire us. Thank you. Am I wild? Can you hear me? Is it coming through? Perfect. Well, thank you. This is such a lovely invitation. I, I, I've never done anything like this before, and I'm just fascinated how it makes the, the book need to be written differently. But writing began for me as a child during World War II as letters to my parents during the war, the, the years that I lived as an evacuee in four different parts of England. It was the only means of contact that we had with our parents. I've read a little bit about, I've mentioned a little bit about it uh, in today's reading, but I have uh, read more about the actual wartime experience. It was, it, it's seen here as um, something almost untouchable, but it was a way of life. And so people ask whether um, being a child and evacuee and not part of, uh, isolated from my own family for nearly five years, and it was a way of life. So the letter writing was absolutely wonderful. Mm. Um, and I find that pen and paper are absolutely my go-to favorites. And when I'm having a hard time or stuck, I had a wonderful tip from a friend of mine who was a writer. And he said, Barbara, when you get stuck, just start all over again and write it as if you were sending a letter, writing a letter to someone you love. And it moves it from the heart, head to the heart. It helps. And um, you also asked whether I edit. And I, 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 I can't do that. But what I have found is that every once in a while, when I have transcribed into the computer, the computer simply lost it. 
And I eventually found out that that was a gift because I had to start all over again and it was much better writing. And my title, Don't Push the River, is pretty much the way I see my own life. So the Chinese proverb serves me well. So I'm going to read you, um, you're warned, because this, this was written, this whole book was written for my sister's children um, because we are a split up family in different countries. We didn't have the chance to have, sit around the table and telling stories. And so, as I had been writing all my life, these letters to my family, as I grew older and I moved into different countries and lived abroad, I found that the letters, the, the stories were, I, I was keeping them. And then I joined a writing group, which was quite a gift. And they gave me an idea how other people hear stories. When you write a letter, you know how the people write back to you, but you really don't know what, what it stirs, what questions it asks. Exactly. So I'm, I'm wandering here, and I'm starting at, um, the, my book is many different stories which are in sequence but can be read totally separately. This one is called The Village Reverie, and if you nod off while I'm reading it, and I'm not reading it all, don't be surprised. So the village of Pittswood in Kent, where I grew up, is imprinted on my memory as part of a happy-go-lucky childhood. And sometimes before dropping off to sleep, my thoughts love to wander around there, in the old haunts, making rounds of the shops, as if time had stood still. It was a small village with, with winding streets, well-cared-for homes and gardens, big old trees and meadows, and many children some nights the details can be quite vivid as I lie there. I leave my home and walk up the street to the shops. I stroll past the gate of the visiting nurse as she gets on her bicycle, wearing her crisp striped uniform with a cape around her shoulders, ready to call on a patient. She doesn't come to our house because Dr. Jenner lives nearby so we can walk to see him. She doesn't have to call on us. When I pass the empty lot on the corner of Manor Way, the first shop I come to is the old wine cellar and off-license, where once a week a horse-drawn dray delivers, rolling large wooden barrels of beer through the heavy basement trapdoor in the pavement down into the cellar. I don't stop here long because I'm drawn by the rich smell of baking next door at Kay's Pantry. My mother always buys cherry and dundee cake here when she doesn't bake her own. They were lovely. In my teenage years, I meet my friends here on Saturday mornings for coffee and to catch up on local gossip. Then I might have a quick look in the window of the one jeweler in the village, but next door has much more appeal. It's a pet shop with puppies, kittens, guinea pigs in the window and bowls of goldfish inside on the shelf. Since Paddy, our Irish terrier dog, bit me on the lip when I tried to ride his back a little while ago, my mother won't let us have any more pets, but we can only long for her to change her mind. Further down the road is Ray's Corner, the ironmonger. They always have a display of heavy oak wheeled barrows outside the pavement, their shiny hand-pushed hand lawnmowers and lawn and, and wood shafted stainless steel spades and forks like my father's. And inside are hemp sacks of grass seed and who knows what. The shop sells rope oak, soaked in oakum, a smell I would recognize again many years later when I married Bob and we spent many happy years sailing and being around boats. But the shop with the biggest draw for every age is Bunny's Sweet Shop, where Vera, a diminutive family friend greets everyone with a huge smile. Inside, I'm surrounded by shelves laden with jars of boiled sweets, chocolate satin cushions, licorice all sorts, mint humbugs, barley sugar, lollipops, and more. 
Glass top counters display boxes of fondants and chocolates. And on the wall behind the cash register are cigarettes, cigarette paper and rollers, tobacco, cigars, small tins of lighter fuel, flints and matches, and snuff, which my father uses. On the floor are bottles with hinged caps of Tizer, ginger beer, lemonade, orange and lemon squash, and cream sodas, and nearby a freezer filled with ice cream bars and more special treats. As we got older, Vera let my little sister help her behind the counter for pocket money. Sheila loved her job, which I'm sure was paid in sweets. In fact, this job saved her life the day our house was bombed, which is part of another story. In the 1930s, there was very little traffic and cars on the roads, and we were allowed to walk freely in the village after carefully looking both ways before crossing the street. Across from Bunny's was Ashling's, where white dishes of galantine of chicken sit alongside other delicious savory delights for lunch or dinner inside the ice cool counter. In their kitchen, they make pâtés, savory rissoles, and steak and kidney pies with delicious flaky pastry, which my mother sometimes buys for a treat. Next door is a bicycle shop where we got our bikes and where we go to mend punctures or get things to put in our leather, leather saddle pouches. There are two chemists in the store, Copeland and Farron's. Mr. Farron's shop is favored by my mother because when, before penicillin or antibiotics had been discovered, he was, to, he was willing to deliver medicine day or night when my baby sister was so ill. Both shops have intriguing and familiar things for sale and an unmistakable antiseptic smell. Invalid feeding cups with long spouts and porcelain bedpans are hidden behind boxes of bandages, triangle cotton slings, glass thermometers with quicksilver in the stem, black currant pastilles for a sore throat, tincture of iodine and oil of cloves, Calamine lotion, hot water bottles, stone and rubber, rolls of cotton and wool, molten cod liver oil, naphtha, large safety pins for babies' nappies, scales for weighing babies, and more and more, and more than things that I know names of. Both Mr. Copeland and Mr. Farrant seem quite grand in their long white coats with gold rimmed spectacles perched on the end of their noses as they peer over the counter from the dispensary. In the middle of my reveries, I often fall asleep around here, wandering through all these things. But there are more. There is the butcher shop and all of the things that were scary, like the big walk-in freezer. There's the greengrocer who wears a brown heavy coat there's a fishmonger who wears a white long-sleeved brown coat and a flat straw boater hat. Their, their produce comes from local farms and the fish comes from every day straight from Billingsgate Market on the train to the village. There are two bakeries. There's a shoe shop. And that's where we would go twice a year to be measured for shoes and sandals. And I remember that they made certain that there was enough room for growing feet because most self-respecting shoe shops have an x-ray machine which has a special appeal. Looking down the view funnel, we can wiggle our toes in the eerie green light and see not only our bones but each little crooked nail the cobbler has pounded into the sole. There are two banks, Lloyd's and Martin's, but they're really not very interesting. And there's Miss Pullins, the haberdasher's shop, where my mother buys Liberty Cotton Lawn for the dressmaker to make summer frocks with beautiful stocking or smocking. But the exciting thing about this shop was the serial wire system where the customer's money from the counter was put into a cylinder and on a tug of a cord would fly on wires up to the ceiling where the cashier mm -hmm. hid behind a window. That was mysterious. 
there was the hairdressers, there was the underwear, there was the post, post office. And then there were two dairies. One had its own tea rooms and on the other side of the road, a horse and delivery cart. And we got to know the milkman who delivered the milk and eggs to our front door. He drives the horse pull, he, one of the horse pull carts with ice cold compartments and he sometimes lets us put the horse's nose back on when they stop for lunch. I once asked him how he knew the difference between a girl horse and a boy horse. I think he just smiled. <laughs> there was a garage in town where they sold cars and you could uh, rent a rent a car to drive. There were two groceries and my mother preferred Cullen's because Mr. Cullen himself used to call at our house on his bicycle every week to take her order. She said she'd seen the boys, the, the boys in Sainsbury's next door beating water into the blocks of butter to make it work way more. And she thinks their greenback bacon isn't always fresh. She's also seen them put their thumb on the scale when they weigh things, so they didn't count. There's an inn in the middle of the town, and then there are the, the individual tradesmen whose jobs are intriguing. I see the ice man who delivers large blocks of ice year round, wrapped in heavy sacking on his horse-drawn cart, summer and winter, he stops at all the homes with ice boxes like ours, and with a large steel hook, he grabs the ice in its sack and carries it to the station. Some nights before I fall, finally fall asleep, anyone asleep yet? <laughs> there are a few more images, and I remember the coal delivery man who probably has the dirtiest job and clothing. We have to telephone our orders to the, their office near the railway station and he himself drives a horse-drawn flatbed wagon wearing heavy leather apron over his shiny black coal-dusted impregnated clothing with strings tied around his trousers under his knees. As often as not, he has his head poked in the corner of one of his heavy old coal sacks, which maybe helps cushion the rough bumpiness of the large sacks of coal. He hefts one of these heavy sacks off the wagon onto his back and walks to our coal bunker at the side of the house. Otherwise, there's not very much for him to do with us. Now, the rags, bottle, and bones man doesn't have much time for us either, as he sits sideways on his horse-drawn wooden two-wheeled cart, looking as if he's dressed in the rags he's hoping to collect, driving around the neighborhoods with his sing-song calls rags, bottles, and bones. And the most elusive person roving the streets is the Basque onion man, who only appears when the Spanish onions have been harvested. Wearing his large black berry on his head with strings of onions around his neck and hanging from the handlebars of his bicycle, he rides around the streets ringing his bell. Now at dusk every fall, uh, as dusk falls every night, the lamplighter rides around on his bicycle, one arm through the rung of the ladder balanced on his shoulder. Then resting the ladder against the lamppost, he reaches up with a long stick to tend the gas mantle and turn on the gas. With each pop, there's a circle of light shining on the pavements outside the houses on every street. Having done another of my of rounds of my memories just before I opened the gate to our home, I'd sometimes go across the road to Bunty Bale's house to thank her for the birthday party. I'd never seen such a birthday cake before. Decorated with green icing, white lines, and a net, it was a tennis court. And there goes the crumpet man, carrying an oilcloth covered flat wooden tray on his head, ringing a handbell as he walks the streets. If there's a fire on in the sitting room, we might be having crumpets for tea today. Some nights I see them all. It's like counting sheep. Shall I keep mm -hmm. going? Mm -hmm. So, 
we were one of the history books reports that a random bomb fell I'm jumping through the eras a random bomb fell in the outskirts of London on June the 19th 1940 actually it fell at the far end of the driveway of, of the school in Chislehurst where my sister and I were temporary boarders I was 11 and she was seven and the bomb did not explode but the event signaled the beginning of the peripatetic life we would live for the next five years. Within 48 hours, our school was closed for the duration, a phrase which became a standard throughout the war. At the school, there were about a dozen of us whose families had decided not to send their children to Canada or the United States. Hurried plans were made by the school and our parents to evacuate us to Somerset in the West Country, far from London, where we hoped we would be safest from German attack. I go on a little further and we are now moving. It's September 1940. My little sister Sheila and I were once again living far from home. Until the month before we'd been in Somerset, where we hadn't been so safe from the bombs after all. And a bomb had exploded in a field nearby where we were living. So new arrangements were made and now we were in Totley near Sheffield in Yorkshire, living with my father's brother, our uncle Jimmy. It was our second home in less, a, less than a year. I was uncertain what was expected of me when my mother told me, now take care of your little sister, as she left us with, in the care of relatives we barely knew. I'm sure she hoped we would stay there for the duration of the war, or at least until it was safe, safer to come back to our home, closer to London. So there are some stories in here about the school that we went to and another school we went to there. And then December 1940, the raids began in earnest in December 1940. The target was Sheffield, which is the center of, she of fine stainless steel. And we squeezed nightly onto the makeshift bunks in the shelter and slept there fitfully. For days and nights, we heard the sounds of street of sirens, air raids, bombs, and anti-aircraft guns, followed by the angry light of fires flashing from afar in the night sky, a sky dotted with barrage balloons tethered to the earth below. The destruction from that blitz on Sheffield had immediate serious consequences. The city's central water supply system had been ruptured in the bombing and everyone had to be inoculated against typhoid and diphtheria. The live serum was so virulent that we children were greatly affected. I remember running an agonizing high fever for days and aching in every bone in my body. For whatever reason, we stayed on in spite of the blitz. On our second Christmas at Totley, our mother came to visit us again, bearing much needed clothing with plans for moving us again. She had scrounged, borrowed, and saved up all the clothing coupons she could find. She had gifts for us, which we couldn't open until Christmas Day. Somehow she had found a pair each of lovely fur-lined leather boots, brown for Sheila, blue for me, and a siren suit for Sheila and a dressing gown for me. The siren suit was made popular by Winston Churchill and was a large piece of utility material coverall suit to, to try to keep the body warm. Christmas morning was clear and cold we could hardly wait until we were allowed to open our parcels and wear our splendid gifts out on the snow which had just blown them down from the moors. The house warmed slowly as Aunt Nora coaxed the night banked coal, back, uh, coal fire back to life and uh, cooking the, the, to cook the turkey stuffed with breadcrumbs. And the rest of the cooking would be done on the gas stove in the kitchen. 
first uh, stockings were empty f from Santa. One solitary orange, nuts, and near sugarless chocolate wafers were nibbled with delight. This was not a time of plenty. Finally, the packages under the tree were torn apart, and at last Sheila and I were able to thrust our longing feet into those boots. Disbelief. They were at least one size too small. We had grown rapidly in the past month. We were heartbroken, but never let our mother know as we tried to run around with no circulation in our very cold feet. Later, Sheila found at least she could get into my pair, although her siren suit was awfully snug. Well, I think that, uh, I don't know how my yeah. training is going. Yeah, I think that might be... That might do might it. Might do it. Yes. Thank you so Thank much. You. I You're love welcome. going to Pets Wood with you and seeing all those places and imagining this one store and the next store and the next store. Thank, Thank you. you so much, You're very Barbara. welcome. Thank and you. one more time, there is a copy of Don't Push the River in the library as we speak on and the windowsill in the back of the library. Take care, have a good week, and see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.